Hello and welcome to episode 80 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR. I am the one who named one of his sons after Sam Hinkey. And today I am joined by your favorite fantasy guy's favorite fantasy guy. It is Evan Silva. Evan, what's going on? What's going on, Adam? I've um, been doing a lot of drafts recently, uh, multiple FPC main event teams. I wrote about one in uh, for our, our draft kit. I think it's actually f- up free. Uh, you, yeah. can, you can read. Um, obviously did the Scott Fish Bowl. Um, I've done some quote unquote expert leagues. Um, so, and, and, you know, finally got settled in after moving. And so I've been able to sit down and really go through the, the 150 and the tiers and, and everything. I've been making a lot of changes. Some of them are, are small little tweaks. But I want to, I want to, you know, fine tune it every day, uh, and make sure that it's it's perfect and that it's you know up to date, you know, based on every. We don't have a lot of news right now. I also want to make sure that it's up to date based on, um, you know, testing my my convictions on players in all these drafts. And and if you look at the change log uh, at establishtherun.com, you'll see that I, I made a ton of changes recently within the last week or so. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today, the changes that Evan has made after testing the rankings in drafts. And I think, you know, the, the best way to figure out where you're at on guys is A, to do a ton of research. And to that end, like this time last year, we didn't we had just started the site. Like we were just getting into it. And so people are saying, oh, well, uh, why are you making changes now? There, nothing's going on. We are continuing to do research, continue to uncover new things that are going to shape the rankings, by the way, uh, yes, it's our one year anniversary. Shout out to us. Uh, can't thank everyone enough for the support. We really appreciate it as a gift. Don't forget, go back to last week, establish run Twitter. You'll find a nice little Hugh Jackson video, a little gift uh, from us to you on our one year anniversary. Uh, before we get into it today, Evan, I wanted to remind everyone that the NBA National Basketball Association returns next week live from the bubble in Orlando. DFS action is going to be absolutely out of control. In my opinion, Uh, we put a ton of time and resources into the NBA product we are launching, featuring Drew Dinkmeyer, featuring Mike Gallagher, featuring Andrew Wiggins. If you're planning to play NBA DFS, I think there's going to be a really big edge, particularly in these first eight games where it's going to be like a preseason almost. Uh, So head to the site, check it out. Just $99 for the rest of the season, including playoffs. Also on a separate pod feed, you do have our NBA podcast, just like this one, free if you want to see what's going on. All right, we are going to get into it now. They want people, they want to know what's the provocation for the rankings changes at this point. We are going to explain. The first one that we're going to talk about, Aaron Jones has flip-flopped in the rankings with Austin Eckler. Aaron Jones is now ahead of Austin Eckler in the rankings. And this one kind of, I, I don't want to be high on Aaron Jones, who was outrageous in terms of touchdown rate, who has a coach in Matt LaFleur who played Deion Lewis over Derrick Henry when he was in Tennessee. In games last year where Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams were both healthy, the split was like 60-40 in a best-case scenario for Aaron Jones. He was just smashing because he was scoring two, three touchdowns in a game. And obviously when Jamal Williams was hurt, he was smashing. I will say that ESPN wrote an article this week saying that Jamal Williams could be released or traded. I don't know about that, though. Jamal Williams only making $2.1 million this year. I don't see why they would necessarily want to Release him. Maybe if they found a trade partner, I doubt somebody's going to give up much for Jamal Williams. They do have Tyler Irvin behind them. But anyways, I know I said a lot here, Evan. What's your take on moving Aaron Jones ahead of Austin Eckler? It's it's a small move. It's not a big move. Neither guy changed tiers. Um, I, I just you know it's one of the situations where I'm I'm drafting and I would rather have Aaron Jones on my team right now than Austin Eckler. I think that the threat of AJ Dillon remains real but not quite as real as had there been rookie minicamp and, and, you know, June mandatory minicamp and and OTAs and, you know, four preseason games, you know, so I I think that you will see a constant theme in the change log that in these situations where a rookie running back is entering um, the the competition uh, in a backfield competition in particular, like carry on Johnson, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones, you know, uh, Damian Williams, um, even Daryl Henderson, yeah, along with uh, Cam Akers. I'm giving the veterans a little bit, you know, a little bit of a bump up. And 
Um, I think that that's a little bit that has to do uh, with, with this. Aaron Jones can catch a lot of passes too. Um, you know, I think he's going to clearly remain the Packers go to back uh, when it comes to uh, throwing the football to out of the backfield. AJ Dillon was not a productive receiver at Boston college and, and every day that he's not there with Aaron Rodgers and earning Aaron Rodgers trust. Like that's an, that's another bump up for Aaron Jones and a bump against AJ Dillon, who is not in our top 150. Um, and Aaron Jones got that little bump. Yeah. I, what I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear people take Aaron Jones in the second or third round and then bitch that Jamal Williams and AJ Dillon are getting work. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to hear it because you know that going in, you know that Aaron Jones is going to lose time to these guys. I think, that Aaron Jones can still be extremely productive because he's hashtag good and the scheme is very perfect for him. But man, I don't want to hear any complaining. Like, I can't believe Jamal Williams got 12 touches in this game. Like, yeah, like that's well, well, well within the range of outcomes. So, you know, it just is what it is. I, I prefer, um, God, that back end of the second round is not where I want to be drafting, which is why I know you, you sent exactly. a tweet. Yeah, I know yeah. you sent a tweet about either wanting 1.1 or just get back. And I'm starting mm-hmm. to kind of come around on that too because – God, when you get back there in the back of the second round, it's not too pretty. So No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Um, and I, I recently, or I'm doing a, in, in the midst of a, of a FFPC main event draft, and we got 1.02. We were excited to get Saquon Barkley. But, man, it comes back, and it's like it's definitely rough at, at right around that 2-3 turn. We, we, we were really lucky to actually get Aaron Jones at 2.11 um, because I didn't want to take, like, James Conner at, at 2.11. Right. Okay. Let's go to wide receiver. Kenny Galladay up to wide receiver 11. You previously had him as the wide receiver 14. He's now ahead of Odell Beckham. He's now ahead of Mike Evans. He's now ahead of DeAndre Hopkins. I think if Matthew Stafford had stayed healthy the entire year last year, nobody would bat an eye at this. I I think people forget Kenny Galladay played the last eight games of the year with David Blau and Jeff Driscoll. I am completely down to be high on Kenny Galladay, who is still just 26 years old, was on pace for 70 12 80 14 when Matthew Stafford went down last year there's a lot of competition at the top of the wide receivers like Odell Mike Evans DeAndre Hopkins all very very good players talk to me about moving Kenny Galladay up yeah I mean no it's not you know it's not like um you know a situation where you know anything happened obviously it was just I I just I was like I'm too low on, on Kenny Galladay I mean Kenny Galladay you know I've been a believer in Kenny Dolly since he came out of college. Um, his ADP uh, in FFPC drafts right now is wide receiver seven. And we had him wide receiver 14. And what I did is I essentially just split the difference. Um, I want our audience to you know, be in position to take Kenny Galladay if he slips a little bit past his ADP. And you, just, you weren't going to get him at all uh, at wide receiver 14. Now at least you got a shot to get him. Um, I like the offense. I, I, I think that, you know, they, in, in my, uh, my Sneaky Stacks article, uh, the Lions were one of my favorite teams to kind of discuss. I think that um, everyone but Kenny Galladay is a little bit undervalued, I think. And I just want to make sure that we weren't way too below consensus that, you know, we have no shot to get Kenny Galladay because he's a good pick. I, I think he is a little overvalued right now, um, but, you know, not, not that overvalued that, um, you know, we, that we, we don't want to have any shot to, to get him. Yeah, I mean, so much has been made of the Ben Roethlisberger coming back from injury. Not enough has been made of Matthew Stafford coming back from injury and giving a big, big boost to this offense. Let's talk about Chris Carson down to RB19 from RB17. Small move there, but he's now behind Melvin Gordon, behind Jonathan Taylor. Chris Carson, obviously coming off of the hip fracture, says that he's healthy. Also, they add Carlos Hyde. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think that was more about Rashad Penny's health. Rashad Penny, I do not expect to be ready for the season. But we'll see. They also have DJ Dallas. They do also have Travis Homer. Talk to me about this tier, this little spot here with Chris Carson, Melvin Gordon, and Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, so I wanted Carson sort of end of that tier before he was more toward the top of the tier, and now he's toward the end of the tier. Um, This came about when I was doing my Seahawks team preview, uh, I believe. And, you know, just examining the situation with Chris Carson. I mean, he's coming off a fractured hip. Now, he did not require surgery on his broken hip. So that makes it sound like it's not as significant of a fracture. But the Seahawks did make moves to protect themselves against Chris Carson's health, um, which has been an issue in the past. Fumbling was a major issue for him 
last year. But they went out and they did sign Carlos Hyde, and they drafted DJ Dallas in the fourth round. So they have options. I still think that the, the Seahawks beat writers think that, he's, that Chris Carson is going to come back and be the, you know, the locked-in lead back. But I think that there's just a little, you know, there's, there's enough concern there that I don't want to have Chris Carson ranked super aggressively. I, I think that we're either right in line or still a little bit ahead of him from an ADP standpoint. But I didn't want to be so out in front of ADP because, uh, because there are real concerns there with Chris, with Chris Carson from his backfield competition to his, his health. Yeah. And, and, you know, ideally, this is not the range. This is like the tail end of the range, I guess I would say, where I'm willing to take running backs in that like round four to like round eight range is not where I want to be taking running backs. There, It's where I want to be pounding wide receivers. So, you know, if these guys slip into that range, maybe, but this is like the end of it. This is where I would like cut it off. So it's an interesting thing to talk about. And people should definitely be thinking through where the cutoff is for them with running backs in rounds three, early round four. Uh, okay. We spent a lot of time on, on Will Fuller. Uh, I don't really want to get into it too much, but you did move Will Fuller ahead of Jarvis Landry. Will Fuller now up to 55th overall. Definitely way, way, way ahead of ADP, which obviously I like. I've consistently uh, get it, been getting him in like the seventh or eighth round, which is just egregious. You know, and, and like the best argument against Will Fuller is obviously he's always hurt or, you know, he's never done it. I just don't play fantasy like that. Like when you tell me a guy hasn't done it, like, yeah, it's relevant, but I'm trying to predict what will happen this year, not what's happened in the past. Like, I get that he's never had more than 700 yards in a season. To me, that's not a real argument not to take him now where the situation is different. DeAndre Hopkins is gone. He comes into the year healthy. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time here. We, we have uh, made our stance very clear on Will Fuller. Anything to add, though, on moving Will, Will Fuller all the way up to 55th overall? Well, his ADP has been creeping up, and I want to make sure that we stay out in front of that ADP. Because uh, people that are, you know, a little bit sharper are starting to draft more. Um, and also, I definitely wanted to get him ahead of Jarvis Landry, who is coming off of hip surgery and is not necessarily a lock to be ready for week one. I mean, this is sort of – this is a scary situation with regard to how, you know, COVID-19 has affected um, just our, our knowledge of players' rehabs, you know. So um, I kind of want to start to take more of a stance against – guys that are coming off surgery because uh, significant surgeries, because we, we just don't know what's up. And I don't know when we're going to get those answers. I mean, I don't know when, when, when we're going to get answers at, at all with regard to guys recoveries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll talk more about Jarvis Landry uh, in, a, in a minute here. I want to move to Marquise Brown, who, uh, um, you know, I did the poll with Dink and I, I was just shocked at the results. I cannot believe, I still can't believe People would prefer Marquise Brown to Will Fuller. The, the, the funniest part of the argument is that people act like Marquise Brown is not some injurious. Marquise Brown is legit 5'9", 170. Like, and I get that Tyreek Hill has done it at that uh, size. But, man, like, if you look at historical comps, Tyreek Hill is such a massive, massive outlier. And I get that I have been burned you know, by outliers in a big way. You know, uh, Odell Beckham rookie year. Um, you know, I guess Derrick Henry down the stretch last year would be considered an outlier too. Like he's just total freaks. And maybe Marquise Brown is that, but I think in the long term we profit by betting against guys being total complete freak outliers. And we're gonna have Mike Leone on uh the podcast soon. But even if he gives, I mean, we were talking to him about Marquise Brown, even if we give Marquise Brown a 22% target share, even if you bump up the Ravens pass volume massively, it's still hard to get Marquise Brown there in terms of what his ADP is, which currently sits in the 60s, low 70s. So that said, you, you did move Marquise Brown up. He's still behind Will Fuller. You have Marquise Brown, wide receiver 29. Will Fuller, wide receiver 27. I feel like we haven't spent enough time this offseason yet getting your Marquise Brown full thoughts out there because he's clearly a pretty polarizing guy. Yeah, I mean, he's – and he already had the Liz Frank uh, fracture that, that required surgery, and he was on the injury report like every single week last year. Um, he should be fully healthy. Uh, and fully recovered from, from all that. Um, he plays in you know, the NFL's most run-heavy offense. The, the Ravens were what, dead last in pass attempts last year. I think that there's going to be severe regression uh, when it comes to Lamar Jackson's touchdown pass total. You know, I think he's probably going to go from 36, throwing 36 passes. He led the league in passing touchdowns on the team that threw the ball the least amount in the NFL. That, 
you want to talk about outlier, you know, that's, that, that is an outlier right there. Um, and I think that his touchdown pass total is going to go from like 36 to like 25, maybe even like 22 to 24, somewhere in that range. I mean, 9% touchdown rate is, is obviously unsustainable. Uh, Marquise Brown scored seven touchdowns last year on, on not, you know, not a big catch total. I mean, I think he's going to be a spiked week player. I think he's a great, great best ball pick. I think he's going to be frustrating in season long. And I think that when it comes to that debate uh, against Will Fuller, I mean, I, f- I fully side with you. And it sounded like Leone si- sides with us too uh, against Dink. And I don't, yeah. I don't like to, to, to argue with Dink, you know, Dink, Dink <laughs> like the smartest dude on the planet. But um, yeah, I think that Will Fuller has a chance to get like 30 or 40 more targets than does Marquise Brown because of the way that the Texans play, because of that, uh, that, that built-in rapport that Will Fuller has with Deshaun Watson that the, the other guys in the offense do not have. David Johnson is new. Randall Cobb is new. Brandon Cooks is new. You know, Kenny Stills is, I don't know, looks like their fourth receiver. So um, I, I like betting on, on all those factors with Full, Will Fuller. Obviously, we know that the injury risk is there. And, but, you know, that's, that's why we're getting him in the seventh round. You know, if injury risk wasn't there, where is Will Fuller going? At the 2-3 turn, maybe? I mean, I, I think he's probably going in the top 10 among wide receivers. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's just comical to me that people think Marquise Brown is not an injury risk. Um, yeah, I think we're in agreement there. Okay, let's get to somewhere where maybe we aren't in agreement as much. Devontae Freeman, you move up from RB71 to RB51. Um, and you say, you know, in, in your notes that if he lands in Tampa or Philly or San Francisco, um, his ADP is going to soar. And maybe it will. I'm not sure that this Devontae Freeman is better than Boston Scott. Like if he signs in Philly, do we really think he's better than Boston Scott? I'm not sure. You currently have Boston Scott, RB44. Obviously, Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, Devontae Freeman all aren't going to pay off at that price. It's a hedge if Devontae Freeman ends up getting signed. Um, so we'll see where Devontae Freeman ends up. You know, he claimed that, or I think the Bucks claimed they couldn't afford Devontae Freeman. Devontae Freeman shot back that they didn't even get in touch with him. They don't know how much he costs. They didn't even talk to him. So it's kind of a weird thing. Do you think Devontae Freeman ends up signing somewhere and do you think he'd actually take a role from someone like Boston Scott? Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree that Boston Scott is, you know, has just his chance to be as, as effective as Devonta Freeman in, in 2020, I, you know, but Boston Scott also is um, a big special teams player. And um, I think that if the Eagles were to sign Devonta Freeman, he would be like the clear cut number two back. And then um, if Miles Sanders were to go down, then, you know, there would be some sort of a committee just RB71 was just way too low to have Devontae Freeman. I do think that he's likely to, to find a, a home. And I think that there are a lot of scenarios where it, it could be, um, you know, a beneficial home, whether it be San Francisco with this Raheem Mostert trade demand going on or, um, you know, and Jarek McKinnon's health being uncertain in Tampa Bay. You know, what if, I mean, what if Tom Brady says, you know, I don't, I don't trust Keyshawn Vaughn or, or, or Ronald Jones. We need to bring in a veteran that I trust. And, you know, Devontae Freeman just finds his way onto the field there. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's got the history with, uh, with Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco as well. So, I, I, I mean, once he gets signed, his ADP is going oh, yeah. to skyrocket. And I just wanted to be a little bit ahead of that. Um, I think he's like a fine, like 13th round pick right now uh, in FFPC uh, because I, you know, I, I, I do think that there's a, a chance that he's like a factor and offers some flex value. Yeah. Using our rank and uploading them into your draft applets. I mean, it makes such a huge difference if you're drafting off of your own rankings uh, or rankings that we provide for you versus uh the what's in there in the applet like Devonte freeman i mean it's not even like in there he's like barely even listed in some of the applets that i've seen we do have rankings up for almost every format imaginable okay uh, i don't want to spend a lot of time on this one damian williams we've we've talked plenty with damian williams about with sig on the last episode and, and talking about rookies and clyde edwards hilaire uh skeptical that he, he will come out of the gate firing with a big role you move damian williams up from rb30 to rb25 just quickly, I think everybody knows the, the stance here that rookies are just going to struggle out of the gate. Yep. Um, I don't think we need to talk about it um, too much more. I mean, yeah. Damian was a damn good player. Um, and 
the, the Chiefs are going to trust him to pass block. He's one of the best wheel route runners in the league. Um, he certainly can get the job done as a rusher. He knows the offense. Like his ADP is, I mean, is has been going up and deservedly so. I might have to move him up even further um, because I, I want him on, on our teams this year. I, I want him as a six, seven, eighth round pick. I don't even think you can really get him in the eighth round anymore. I'm not. He's going in the sixth and the seventh round in, in drafts that I'm doing. All right, let's move to this Tevin Coleman situation. And yeah, another one of my favorite kind of arbitrage uh, uh, later round RB picks. I actually disagree I, a little bit with you and Leone that I would even take Raheem Mostert in the sixth round. And I know his ADP is sinking fast in the wake of the trade demand. Uh, you guys got him in the seventh, which I think is okay value. But in the sixth, I definitely uh, would be out on Raheem Mostert. I just don't think it's crazy at all like well within the range of outcomes that Tevin Coleman actually finishes the year with more touches than brother Raheem. And so uh, you now move Tevin Coleman from RB 38 to RB 33. Tevin Coleman now ahead of Marlon Mack, ahead of Tony, Tony Pollard, ahead of carry on Johnson. It's not that we think Tevin Coleman is good. I think it's just clear that like the market thinks they're so sure that brother Raheem is uh, that much ahead of Tevin Coleman in terms of opportunity when I don't think that's the reality. Talk to the people about Tevin Coleman. I think you just summed it up perfectly because what I did in the, in the change here is I just moved them so they're almost right next to each other. I think that there may be one or two running back spots apart. Um, that they're, they're, now they're really, really close, and that's where they belong because, I mean, even the, the 49ers beat writers think that they're going to share carries evenly. Um, I tend to side with the take that, um, you know, when we had Sig on the show, he thinks that Raheem Mostert is just way better than Tevin yeah. Coleman. And, I mean, I, I, I tend to side with that. I don't think that Kyle Shanahan thinks that, though. You know, I think that Kyle Shanahan has always had this major affinity for Tevin Coleman. And Tevin Coleman played way, way out in front of Raheem Mostert uh, whenever Tevin Coleman was healthy, which w wasn't very often. Last season, he had the high ankle sprain. He's coming back from that. Um, you know, I, the Raheem Mostert situation is interesting because, yes, I'm willing to take him in the seventh round. I, I took him as my RB4 in FFPC main event behind Saquon, uh, Aaron Jones, and James Conner. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a format where you, you start two flex spots and two running back spots. So, you know, hoarding running backs is n never a bad idea uh, in that format. And that's what we we're trying to do. Uh, by taking Raheem Mostert with uh, – the, but, you know, if they – again, the, the trade demand is a fallout from uh, Raheem Mostert's representation wanting Raheem Mostert to be paid in line with Tevin Coleman, which is an entirely reasonable uh, request. And I think that at the end of the day, the 49ers might just pay him. I mean, I think they probably should, even, even if – even if he's not going to lead the, the backfield in touches, he's so good on special teams and he's such a good reserve. He's just a good football player. Um, and then if they do pay him, like his Scott, his ADP is going to skyrocket and he's going to start going like at the, in the, like late in the third round. I mean, I, I think that that, that could happen. So I think that right now is the time to draft Raheem Mostert. Um, and I think that his window begins around the six, seven turn. Yeah, I mean, he's asking for like 1.5 million, which right. I know is a ton of money. But like for the 49ers, it's like pocket change. I'd be shocked if they couldn't find 1.5 million for a player that I think brings plenty of value to their team. So I agree with you that I think they'll for, we'll figure something out. They're not going to get him traded. Like that's just, I mean, that's just not happening. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about the Rams running backs. We haven't talked a lot about this. By the way, Brandon Thorne released his offensive line rankings today. Today's Monday. I think one of the most valuable pieces that we have in the draft kit last year and this year this year brandon thorne did add pad defensive line pass rush rankings also rams check in with the number 27 offensive line in brandon's rankings i mean it's a major concern also major concern for daryl henderson was this scheme fit which i know you've talked about where we're not sure that daryl henderson is the right scheme fit but i assume that the move here moving daryl henderson from rb 41 to rb 37 is just a reflection of wanting to be lower on cam Akers, and therefore Darren Henderson almost has to come up, right? Yes, definitely. Um, and, you know, this was a, a zone running team when Todd Gurley was the main back. Daryl Henderson is, um, you know, historically dating back to, to Memphis, of course. He is a, 
uh, you know, a, a gap runner. And Cam Akers is a gap runner too. So the fact that they that the Rams drafted Cam Akers suggests that they are going to move a little bit away from their zone running game and move toward, more toward a gap running scheme. And I think that that could work to the benefit of Daryl Henderson for sure. I thought that in, in his opportunities, Daryl Henderson didn't embarrass himself uh, last year. And it was, just, it was just a really, really slow rookie season for him, at least partly due to the, you know, the, the schematic changes that he was having to, you know, he was having to learn an entirely different uh, offense than in what he played at Memphis. So uh, now he, he shouldn't be having to do that anymore. He's got the year in the system. Cam Akers does not. And again, you know, I think that every day that these rookies um, who have just spent no time with their quarterbacks, no, no time with their coach side, it's like Zoom conferences and FaceTime, you know, they're, they're falling behind every day. And I think that the veterans are, are gaining a little bit more momentum every day. Uh, I'm going to skip over Zach Moss because you can go back to the SIG episode to hear me just lay the wood to SIG in, in the most decisive debate of the entire show. I just iced SIG on the Zach Moss uh, debate. Go back and listen to that. Evan has moved him up from RB45 to RB40. I want to get to Curtis Samuel, though. We haven't talked about this very much. Curtis Samuel, I thought you made a good point in the changelog uh, about so many clear out routes that Curtis Samuel ran last year, so many air yards from Kyle Allen and they just didn't mean anything because the routes were so low percentage. He had Kyle Allen throwing to them. It was just not going to work. I think we could see Robbie Anderson assume a lot of those clear out roles like you mentioned and just create a different route tree for Curtis Samuel and Joe Brady, a guy who I think knows how to put his playmakers in uh, winning positions. So I do want to be higher than market on Curtis Samuel, like 14th, 15th round. I've been auto clicking Curtis Samuel. You moved him up from wide receiver 53 to wide receiver 50. Yeah, he, and he's a guy that I'm drafting too. You know, I've started to draft him uh, maybe even a, a little earlier than that in the 12th and 13th round. Uh, no returning Panthers receiver played in the slot more than Curtis Samuel did last year. And I think that you can en envision an offense where Curtis Samuel is the slot receiver and sort of the gadget guy um, and, you know, r running jet sweeps and, and that sort of thing. And then DJ Moore is like the, the flanker, you know, like the Heinz Ward, the run after catch stud. And then Robbie Anderson is the clear out guy. That's what Curtis Samuel was last year. And I, I think that, you know, Robbie Anderson just ends up like a, a role player. You know, Teddy Bridgewater historically does not have a high A dot. He's not really, you know, a truly, you know, he's not a true vertical passer. Um, and I think that that would bode well for Curtis Samuel, who ran just very low percentage routes all last year and all of a sudden I think that he we could start to see him you know they 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 um, manufacture ways to get the ball into his hands because he's he's another great run after catch receiver um, really really dynamic with the ball in his hands they just didn't they didn't get the ball in his hands last year and I think that they will this year or at least I think that there's a decent enough chance to be willing to take Curtis Samuel as like my wide receiver five in the 12th or 13th round he's, mm -hmm. he's he maintains big upside he's gotten better every year I know that a lot of people were hoping for more production than last year, but I mean, his production continually has gone up. So um, I, I think that he's, I think he's a, a, an excellent like wide receiver five pick. I mean, in these large field season long tournaments, if you get the 1.1, you can start Christian McCaffrey. And then it's so cheap to get Bridgewater, Curtis Samuel, Ian Thomas stacks to go with it. Like, man. And I know you talked about that one in sneaky stacks. It's like, God, uh, it's just so cheap. But the key is you do have to start with the 1.1 and get Christian McCaffrey in there, uh, obviously. Uh, okay, this one's going to open some eyes, Evan. This one opened eyes for me. You dropped Hayden Hurst all the way down to tight end 17. I've seen Hayden mm -hmm. Hurst going as like the tight end nine mm -hmm. sometimes. I've seen people take Hayden Hurst and like they found that FFPC draft that we did, which is in the draft kit where we uh, record ourselves doing the FFPC 350 draft. Hayden Hurst went in like the fifth or sixth round or something totally insane. You now have Hayden Hurst behind. TJ Hawkinson, who I like. You have him behind Dallas Goddard. You have him behind Mike Jasicki, who I know you don't like, but I like. You have him behind Ian Thomas. You have him behind Noah Fan. I like all those guys. I just think – and I don't really have a huge take on Hayden Hurst other than there's so many vacated targets with Mo Sanu and Austin Hooper gone. Um, I assume that this has something to do with Hayden Hurst not being there for the offseason coming in as a free agent. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's just – he's purely a, a projection – even if there had been mini camp and, and OTAs and everything, I mean, he still would have had to be learning a new offense. We still don't really know 
about him. Like, how good is he? Uh, he was 10th among tight ends in, or 11th in, uh, among tight ends in yards per route run last year. But, I mean, he wasn't playing that much. Uh, he was a first-round pick, although I remember thinking, like, uh, I, I watched him in college, and I was like, oh, he's going to be an interesting, like, third or fourth-round pick. He goes in the freaking first round. Um, you know, he technically couldn't get on the field ahead of Nick Boyle in Baltimore. I understand that they're, they're different kind of styles of players, but um, – and then, yeah, I mean, having to, to pick up a new offseason or a, a new offense uh, over Zoom conferences and FaceTime. I, mean, I, think, I think that's difficult. The, the change looks really big uh, when, you, when you look at it going from, what, tight end 11 or whatever he was to tight end 17. He's still in that same tier. He did not move out of a tier. That tier, as, as I wrote in the tiers uh, column, is a great testament to the depth of the tight end position this year. And, you know, I – in, in many years in the past, people have talked about the tight end position being, um, you know, or the depth at the tight end position being like fool's gold. I, I'm not so sure about that. You just read off a bunch of really interesting names. Noah Fant was a guy, is a guy that, I mean, he, he could explode this year. A lot of people like Mike Jasicki, and, you know, I get it to some extent. Um, Blake Jarwin is a guy that deserves to move. Eric Ebron could score eight touchdowns, no problem with the Steelers. You know, I, I could go on and on about these guys. Um, so he, he did not move out of the tier, but he is now a guy that we probably are not going to be getting in our drafts. And, and I'm okay with that because I like Noah Fant better. I like Ian Thomas better. I like Jasicki better um, than, than Hayden Hurst. Yeah. I think the difference when this year's late round tight end class is ridiculous athletes, TJ Hawkinson, Mike Jasicki, Ian Thomas, Noah Fant, even Chris Herndon. I mean, these guys are outrageous athletes. And then we throw Goddard and Blake Jarwin into the mix and Ebron, as you mentioned, like you have some serious upsides. So yeah, I, I have no problem being low on Hayden Hurst whatsoever. And in these best ball drafts, I've actually been just trying to take three late round guys, like give me Jasicki, Hawkinson and Fant, or give me, you know, Jarwin, Thomas and, and Hawkinson or something like that. And, and I like doing it that way. Um, Cause I think one of them is going to really, at least one of them is going to find a way to, a really big season. Uh, okay, pretty clear cut one here, removing Justin Jefferson from the top 150. You know, Justin Jefferson is in an extreme run first offense as a rookie dealing with uh, target competition from Adam Thielen and the tight ends. Uh, pretty simple, removing Justin Jefferson, I assume. Yeah, um, and liking Irv Smith uh, a little bit more too, um, as, as, you know, sort of banking on Irv Smith to maybe – fill in some of that, the, uh, what Stefan Diggs is leaving behind and not, uh, and, and not as much from Justin Jefferson. Again, being a rookie in this sort of climate is, is not going to help him. And you know, what's his upside really as the rookie number two receiver on a run first team? Uh, you know, he's, he's probably not going to make a difference in year one. Okay. Here's one we disagree on for sure. You continue to be higher than market on Cam Newton. Now you have Cam Newton all the way up at QB 12. Um, my concerns with Cam Newton are, and I know you're not as worried about the injuries. We're still talking about a Liz Frank injury, a rotator cuff injury on a quarterback who has derived a lot of his value from rushing. We're also talking about a guy with like zero tight ends in the past game. Maybe you think the rookies can do something. I doubt it. He has an unproven Nikhil Harry. He has a career number three in most to new. He has a 34 year old Julian Edelman, he's also on a team with one of the NFL's best defenses, a team that I don't think is going to get into really any wild shootouts this year. Um, from a game environment perspective, from an injury uh, risk perspective, from a weaponry perspective, I'm just not on Cam Newton at all. So uh, moving him up to QB 12 for me uh, is significantly too high, in my opinion. And I know egregious. people love – You wanted love, to say it. egregious – it's 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 not something I would do and I also yeah I mean it's not something I would do and and I'll tell you what I would do I'd much rather wait and just get Teddy Bridgewater for free than take Cam Newton as QB 12 but anyways go ahead on Cam Newton why the big jump oh it's it's a personal preference thing it's having to deal you know having to being willing to embrace the risk of Cam Newton I mean look at the guys around him though this is why I didn't feel bad doing this is because, all right, so here's, here's what I moved them ahead of. Daniel Jones. We, we can't use him in the first three weeks of the season, you know, because of his schedule. We, we, we literally can't use him. 
Um, I do think he's going to be a buy after that, as, as I wrote about in sneak, Sneaky Stacks. Ben Roethlisberger, how much do you trust his health? Um, Tom Brady, he's got a brutal schedule as well in the first five games where there's only one week in those first five where I would even want to use Tom Brady. He adds nothing with his legs. Baker Mayfield, I think, you know, the name of the game is – and he's going to lack volume this year, I, I think. He's going to lack volume. I think he's going to be more efficient, but he's going to lack volume. So those are the guys that I moved Cam ahead of, and I don't feel bad about having him ahead of any of those guys. Um, so, you know, it, you have to embrace risk. You have to embrace the, the durability risk. And for some people, they're just – they're not going to do this. You know, they're not going to take Cam Newton to be their, their starting quarterback. Uh, in fantasy football, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the upside is absolutely there uh, for Cam Newton to n- not even just finish within the top 12, which is where I have him now, but to be a top five quarterback if everything breaks right for him. The offensive line is going to be stellar in New England, and this is going to be the best play calling of his career under Josh McDaniels. Yeah, I mean, for sure, big coaching bump. I'm glad that you left Cam behind Matthew Stafford, though, because Matthew Stafford's just going to smash uh, Cam Newton, in yeah. my opinion, in fantasy oh, yeah. points. Um, all right, let's talk Chris Herndon. Uh, we talked about late, right, late round tight ends. The only thing you can knock on Chris Herndon, really, is that Adam Gaze just dusts everyone. But I, I like trying to be higher than market on Chris Herndon. He had a 39-5024 season as a rookie. And like that doesn't sound like much for a rookie tight end. That is really, really solid. I do think Sam Darnold is a little bit better than maybe the public consensus is. And if he could get away from Adam Gaze, maybe even better. Obvious coaching concerns. But yeah, you know, you moved Chris Herndon above Jack Doyle and for upside. And I couldn't agree more that Chris Herndon's upside is just, I mean, you can't even compare it to Jack Doyle's. Yeah, I wish I could put Herndon higher. I mean, I would like to have him at like tight end 13 or tight end 14. It's just that I I can't trust this donkey coaching and, um, you know, they – Ryan Griffin, like, wasn't bad in that role. And then they gave him an extension after the season. And if they sp- try to split time with Herndon and Ryan Griffin – I mean, that was one of the, the great things about uh, really the last two years with the, the Jets' tight ends, relatively speaking. I mean, Ryan Griffin didn't, you know, tear the cover off or anything like that. But they, they were out there playing as full-time players. Yep. And so is Herndon going to come back and be a full-time player? Um, I don't know. I mean, he's caught one pass during the Adam Gase regime. You know, what, what kind of – Adam Gase is a – like he plays favorites with, with players. And so that's a little bit – I wish I could put Chris Herndon higher because I, I definitely believe in his talent. He's also a guy that has a built-in rapport with Sam Darnold because of their production in 2018. And there's not a lot, a lot of other guys on the Jets outside of Jamison Crowder that have that built-in rapport they're changing out both of the perimeter receivers in Rashad Perryman and Denzel Mims. So I don't know, maybe I'll talk myself into moving Chris Herndon up higher, but um, I mean, he's, he's right now in, in a spot where you can get him uh, if you're using the rankings. Yeah. I, one thing I'm disappointed about, and you know, I joke a lot about preseason and, and obviously we love preseason DFS, but the thing that I'm most disappointed in is like, we don't get to see the usage. Like we don't get to see if Chris Herndon's going to be rotating with Ryan Griffin or, or what they're, plan is and you know there's probably right now I think the latest report is there's either going to be one or zero preseason games this year and I mean it just means we're going to fly come in flying even more blind and I think we need to be even more ready than usual after week one to be aggressive on the waiver and be willing to cut guys and move on and and just you know not hesitate like don't be paralyzed by well uh you know Chris Herndon only played 50 percent of snaps but he played well maybe he'll play 100 next week it's like god we're just gonna have to be willing to just just move on um at some point. Yeah, that's, that's been a competitive advantage for us over the years is being able to put that magnifying glass. Everybody says, oh, preseason doesn't matter. Ignore it. You know, you were putting the magnifying glass on um, the, the rotations and, you know, who's, who's in there with the Tom Brady group. And we were able to get a competitive advantage from that. It looks like we're not going to have that advantage this year. Yeah, sad. Sad. Okay. We haven't talked about the Kelvin Harmon injury. And I think, um, you know, it'll just be brushed under the rug for a lot of people, for hardcore people. I think the Kelvin Harmon injury is somewhat significant. You move Terry McLaurin up from wide receiver 19 to wide receiver 17. I, I mean, woeful secondary in Washington, total funnel defense, uh, pathetic, like zero target co- competition for Terry McLaurin. Obvious shower narrative 
with Dwayne Haskins. So I, I think everybody's high on Terry McLaurin who's paying attention right now. I was a little surprised you didn't get Steve Sims into your top 150, though, considering he had been there before. And I removed Kelvin Harmon. Talk to me about what's going on with Washington with Harmon now done ACL tear. Yeah, so the biggest beneficiary actually, I think, is Antonio Gandy Golden, mm -hmm. uh, a rookie out of, I think, Temple. Liberty, Liberty. Liberty, Liberty, yes. Um, and I mean, he now has a chance to maybe be a starter uh, in Washington and just jump right into that Kelvin Harmon role. Yeah. But yeah, McLaurin is a guy that we were already ahead of uh, ADP on. And I just wanted to make sure that we were staying there, you know, because we want Terry McLaurin on our teams this year. He's got like 150 target upside. He's got the shower narrative with Dwayne Haskins. Um, you know, he, he's, he's an explosive, electrifying game breaker. And, uh, you know, some people are going to be, oh, you, you might get double teamed. Like, I, this, is, this is a game about targets. And, and he has a chance at just a, a ton of targets to maybe finish top five in the NFL in targets or something like that. I mean, I, I've been looking at, like, can I move him up any higher? Because, I don't know, it's, it's tough to move him ahead of A.J. Brown. I love A.J. Brown, you know. And then we're getting to D.J. Moore and Mike Evans – territory and it's tough but yeah we're, we're several spots ahead of ADP on Terry McLaurin and I'm going to do whatever I possibly can to make sure that we stay that way I like Antonio Gandhi Golden when I did that um what a elite fantasy wide receiver looks like from a measurable perspective Antonio Gandhi Golden fit that it's just hard for me to see a rookie from Liberty with relatively low draft capital like actually having a year one impact in a year of no OTAs you know so I don't know um, I, I want to be high on Antonio Gandy Golden. It's just, it, it would be a outlier and it surprised me if he was able to contribute in year one. Get, uh, talk about Steve Sims. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it sort of helps uh, the, the job security for Steven Sims. Um, Steven Sims is a slot receiver. Calvin Harmon was almost strictly outside receiver uh, last year. Steven Sims needs to still hold off Trey Quinn. Um, you know, I, this is going to be an opportunity. I don't think that either of them is like, you know, a great, great talent, but um, the opportunity is going to be there. I think for Steven Sims to be a guy that catches four or five balls a game. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that his like his touchdown scoring down the stretch last year was a mirage. Uh, but I, I think that, yeah, I mean, it, it helps his job security. I mean, if you're doing any kind of target projection, you're going to end up with Steven Sims showing a bunch of targets relative to his ADP. I mean, it's just is what it is. I don't think they're very, valuable targets but there's still a bunch of targets considering he's like free um okay we spent so much time on josh allen i don't really want to spend too much time on josh allen i do find it funny though that so many people are like like you're like the josh allen mvp guy now and like you were the josh allen mvp guy when he was 80 to 1 you know now he's 50 to 1 like I, and people just like brush that off they're like oh yeah that's just fire josh allen let's just fire it off at any price it's like come on guys we can be a little bit more price sensitive there's, there's a big difference between 80 to 1 and 50 to one. But anyways, you've dropped Josh Allen behind uh, Deshaun Watson, behind Russ Wilson. I'm totally fine with that. I think it's safer for sure. I mean, the floor on Deshaun Watson and Russ Wilson is for sure better than Josh Allen. Yeah, it's just, you know, getting into these, you know, drafts that, that cost $2,000 to enter, like, I'm not going to take Josh Allen over Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson. And so I had to move him down, you, you yeah. know, just, just to, I don't want to be like disingenuous about this, you know, like this is when, when you have like serious money on the line and you have to make a tough decision, um, you know, that, I, that's important to me. And, and so I moved Josh Allen down to, to a quarterback six. He's still, he's in that tier. He's still in the same tier. Uh, and he goes about two rounds later, uh, in some cases, like three and four rounds later than, than the other guy. So I, I still think he's uh, an excellent value. He's probably the best value pick in that tier. He's got a high floor. He's got a very, very high ceiling. Um, I think he belongs in that. I, ha I still have him ahead of Kyler Murray, um, who I think is being a little bit overdrafted. Okay, let's stick on the Cardinals here. You continue to be lower, way lower than market on DeAndre Hopkins down to wide receiver 14 now. I mean, some people are going to have DeAndre Hopkins like wide receiver four or like wide yeah. receiver five. And you have him wide receiver 14 behind Odell, behind Mike Evans. I think the, the to me, like obviously changing teams for a veteran is historically awful. And also in a Corona age, it's not good to me going to a team that plays a ton of three and four wide sets. 
uh, scares me also. Like what you see when teams run a ton of three and four wide is the target shares just get flattened. It's not like it is when a team runs just two wide receiver sets, you know exactly who the ball is going to get to. You could see games where Christian Kirk goes off for 12 targets or something like that, you know, and you just wouldn't see that with a number three wide receiver uh, getting that kind of work on a lot of teams. But I do think that Arizona will play among the most three and four wide sets in the entire league. Um, but yeah, DeAndre Hopkins down to wide receiver 14. Nothing new here. You just want to be lower the market on him, I think. Yeah, I, I don't want DeAndre Hopkins on my teams this year. Um, he is, you know, he averaged 150 targets a year for five years in Houston. And I think it would be an accomplishment if he were able to get to, to 130 this year. Um, he's got no chemistry with, you know, anybody in the organization uh, from the head coach to the quarterback yet. Um, you know, I think that he's going to run lower percentage routes than he did uh, in Houston. He's going to be on the perimeter like all the time, I think, in Arizona. And that's just, it's just going to take some getting used to. Maybe he'll have a better back half of the season. I think he, I think he might start slow. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, just, it's a situation that I really, really want to avoid. And I think that people are just assuming that he's going to maintain, you know, uh, you know league-leading volume in Arizona, this, this team was at its best running the football right. last year. Uh, they're going to do what's best for the team. And I don't think that pushing 150 targets to uh, DeAndre Hopkins is going to end up being what, what's best for this team. Yeah. I, people think that the air raid that, the, that Cliff Kingsbury is going to throw the ball on every single play. Uh, that's not what's, that's not what's going to happen. As Evan said, they were one of the best, most efficient rushing teams in the league last year. All right, last thing we want to hit on real quickly, dropping Jarvis Landry down to wide receiver 31. Evan already alluded to it. I think one of the better arguments for Jarvis Landry is, hey, this team's going to be in two wide. I mean, I, I mentioned three and four wide for the uh, Cardinals. I think the Browns could lead the NFL in two wide receiver sets, and that obviously pushes a better target share towards Odell, towards Jarvis Landry, but we do have injury concerns. And as Evan said, we don't even know what the status is of Jarvis Landry. I, I think if we get a uh, better health report on him. I'm willing to be uh, reasonably high on Jarvis Landry, but he's always going to be, I think, a better DFS play, especially in cash, than he will be uh, a season-long play. Uh, where are we at with Jarvis Landry? Yeah, we are still above ADP on Jarvis Landry. He's a guy that is consistently, you know, in my range when, when I'm drafting. Um, you know, I still like him as a wide receiver three. It's just uh, I think we were a little bit too bullish on him with the injury recovery. Yep. Okay. Him. A little bit, yeah. All right. We have said it all. A lot of changes coming through as Evan starts to reach peak draft season. We are all getting into peak draft season. Very excited. We do have an action-packed schedule on the podcast this week. We'll be back with Ross Tucker uh, later this week, former NFL offensive lineman, Evan's former partner on the Fantasy Feast. Super smart guy. Can't wait to talk to him. Also, we'll have uh, the co-founder of Underdog, the new uh, best ball site. Uh, we'll have uh, Jeremy Levine on the podcast later this week. Also, we'll also talk to Brandon uh, soon, Brandon Thorne, about his offensive line and defensive line rankings. Appreciate it if you guys could drop a review. Let us know what we're doing well, what you would like to see more of, what you'd like to see less of here on the podcast. So for Evan, for producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.